so yes, what I wanted to share with you today is just uh, sort of an offshoot of my recent research over the last few years. Uh, this one in particular focusing on uh, the attack on the Katumba refugee camp in 2004 and trying to have a bit of a comparative approach to what happened here and how this can help us explain uh, identity and narrative uh, within the Banya Malinge community on the topic of genocide. So I just wanted to share a couple of things just to help get us started here. Um, as you all know, and as um, Delphi mentioned briefly, the Gatumba massacre, August 2004, the, the numbers vary depending on the different reports you'll, you'll see, but probably one of the most um, reliable counts is uh, 163 Banya Malangi refugees were killed. And I'll say a little bit more about that incident going forward. Um, but I just want to summarize a couple of things and then share some uh, theory stuff with you before I get into uh, what I found from the case studies I've looked at. Uh, so what I argue is that genocide, um, and particularly this massacre in the Gatumba camp, uh, forms a distinct narrative point for Banya Malenga groups in the DRC as, and as well in the diaspora. Um, so what I mean by distinct narrative point is both as a product of, of field work that I've done, but then as we you know, see that in sort of social media and activism as well, that um, you know, genocide and again, particularly the Katumba incident form this sort of really distinct narrative point that many people point back to as an explanation for the current situation um, and also for a sort of foreshadowing for what the future may hold as well. Uh, so generally, the sort of the, the theory or the, the idea that I want to put to you today is that episodes of genocide or massacres uh, can shape uh, a group's narrative identity in this very particular way. So the, the diagram here, you know, again, sort of demonstrate that demonstrates that this is kind of a, a, um, a, a progressive cycle. The actor groups who uh, are exposed to or experience massacre uh, develop a genocide narrative identity uh, in relation to that massacre, shaping them as a group, uh, and then allowing that um, that perception to sort of uh, foreshadow events going forward and to also condition memory looking back. The key research question that I'm focusing on here in this paper is how massacre can create a genocide narrative identity. And I'll define uh, what I mean by genocide narrative identity here uh, in a little bit. Um, so what I have done is I've engaged in a little, a very sort of small, small, uh, small n uh, case study uh, or comparative approach here. And so I took the sort of the key features of, of the Gutumba uh, incident and sort of developed a very, very small set of case studies, uh, which I may add to going forward. Uh, so I'd be open to you know, any uh, suggestions you might have when we get to the comments and questions section. Um, but these several points here that I've noted at the bottom just kind of indicate some of the criteria that I've uh, developed, you know, that reflect the Gatumba. Um, so it's a very subjective approach, uh, and I've wanted to sort of capture that in terms, both in terms of the historical record we have for Gatumba and the perception of it as well. Uh, so this ranges from looking at the, indeed, the perceived memory as it being, of it being a distinct narrative point, uh, the small scale of it, um, the perceived connection to a wider genocide, um, but then perhaps also not part of a contiguous successive process of mass killing. And so I'm making a comparison here between incidences like Gutumba and then uh, incidences like, uh, say, you know, the, the multiple um, quickly successive uh, massacres that happened in the Rwandan genocide. And so I'm making a distinction here in terms of, of quick succession and chronology. So whilst there have been, and as you know, as Jean Paul's described, there have been um, you know, various attacks over time on the Banya Malenge, these haven't been as part of a quick series and successive series of, of massacres. They've been spread out over a longer period of time. And I think we'll hear about slow genocide later on from one of the other panels. Um, and then there's also something here about the role of the state and also about severity. And so I've ranked and scored severity uh, based on the incidences of, of these several elements here from looting, burning, rape, forced removal, discriminant and indiscriminate killing and desecration of bodies. So these are the, so the parameters in which I've developed a bit of uh, a comparative model here. 
Um, so massacre is is a, a, a huge part of human history. This is a, a, a massacre, a Neolithic massacre site that was uncovered in France uh, within the last few years. We know it's it's part of who we are as human beings and it's not likely to go away anytime soon, unfortunately. Um, but this is part of some wider theory and, and trend that I wanted to highlight to you. Uh, my approach to genocide is that I define genocide as the destruction of a social group. And I use a relational approach and sort of key to this relational approach is that a wide range of violence is used. It's not all just direct physical violence. Um, but most importantly, that the figurations of the group, right, the, the things that glue the group together, the elements of its identity, its culture, um, when these elements are attacked and dismantled or destroyed, this is when we can see the processes of genocide at work. So that's sort of my, from where I'm coming from, that's how I define genocide and how I think about it. Um, in terms of genocide narrative identity, I generally subscribe to the idea that, you know, the stories we tell shape who we are, and this sort of synthesizes decades of narrative analysis work, and so hopefully it's not too much of an oversimplification, but an important distinction of um, uh, how these narratives and the stories we tell are, you know, productive and reproduced, uh, and then rehearsed and performed uh, at various different stages, creating both uh, a knowledge of the past and also you know, memory uh, of the past for the future going forward. Uh, a lot of this research is based off of field work that I've done uh, in the Great Lakes region, but then also uh, more recently with uh, Banya Malenge diaspora. Hello, Chris. Um, that it's hard to define, right? Uh, it's perhaps we should be asking the question, what isn't massacre? Uh, and certainly what is massacre is included in, you know, these several elements I've listed here from, you know, something that happens on the borderlands to extermination, uh, to the killing of animals where the word sort of originates from as well. Um, the use of low level uh, technology, state support, etc. There are many elements there. Uh, Jack Semelin in his work, on uh, genocide and massacre, you know, offers a fairly reasonable, in my mind, definition, and perhaps a, might, a, a very helpful one um, when we're thinking about this study in particular that I've conducted here. So that massacre is a lexical unit, right? It's a unit of description, uh, a unit of reference, uh, a generally a collective form of action involving the destruction of non-combatants, men, women, children, or disarmed soldiers, which is a key um, sort of, uh, definition of this term. So one that I, I will rely on going forward here. So a Gutumba, uh, and it, it's difficult to define Gutumba by the events that happened on August 14th in 2004, because uh, it's very much situated in the context of broader Congolese conflict and then memory going forward. Um, it's important to note as well that you know refugee camps were frequently sites of violence from the 1990s into the 2000s and even into the presence within Congo and you could perhaps describe this as a global phenomenon as well um, but particularly within uh, the Congolese context and in the Great Lakes region um, you know, refugee camps, um, you know, whether we look at uh, Maliki Stavdi, which was referred to earlier, or the UN Mapping Report, which describes the attacks on uh, Rwandan refugee camps. Um, these are, these sites are, are perceived to be sites of violence. Uh, and this was indeed the case in Gutumba as well. And then they end up being sites of violence in the same breath. Um, prior, just prior to the events of August 14th uh, in 2004, uh, we know that uh, both uh, Goma and Bukavu were um, places of attack and occupation uh, as a result of the forces of Mkunda and Mutabusi um, during that summer of, of 2004. Uh, the reason why I mention these is because this promotes or drives a flood of refugees, not only Banyu Belenge, but other Congolese uh, from South Kivu into Burundi, and this is where you have, uh, and this is why you have, uh, you know, a, civil, a significant Congolese population within uh, the Gutumba camp. Um, so 
we know, you know, various human rights watch reporting uh, or reporting from human rights watch new and reporting try to document what happened in Gutumba. We don't have a, a really thorough account of this yet. That still really needs to be done. Uh, as such, there are a lot of holes and a lot of questions around accountability and you know, what happened uh, and so on, despite the fact that we have lots of witness testimony as well. Uh, so on August 13th, there was reported infiltration of the camp by uh, armed, uh, well, sorry, uh, uniformed and non-uniformed unfamiliar figures. Uh, and then the following, uh, the following day, the attack on the camp began. And as I said, there are lots of um, survivor testimony out there that um, you know recounts how uh, tents were burned. Um, some were able to escape through ripping a hole in the back of the tent and getting out into the into the um, outside of the refugee camp. However, uh, we know that 163 uh, people were killed. Um, what is prominent about what happened in Gutumba is the selective nature. Uh, there were indeed sort of two halves to the camp, and the attack focused on the location of the Banyu Malenge refugees within that camp. Uh, the FNL claimed responsibility, but there's still lots of debate and question about who else might have been involved uh, from uh, the FARDC to Mai Mai. Uh, even some believe um, you know, possible involvement of um, you know, uh, other actors across the region as well. Uh, and this event is significant within diaspora as well because it drives a lot of um, you know, refugee uh, claims and you know, people becoming then uh, part of the diaspora abroad as well. So the four cases that I highlighted that sort of fit the very, very loose uh, categorization of Gutumba are these four here. And I will very, very briefly <laughs> uh, review each of these four and some of you might be familiar with them. Um, I'll start down the bottom, actually we'll start on the top left here. So uh, Kojali uh, in the region of Nagora Karabakh uh, in 1992, we had um, you know, at least 180 people or 180 Azeris were killed by uh, Armenian soldiers during this very tense period of this conflict. Um, this involved a, a desecration of bodies, a burning of, of some of the dwellings in the town um, uh, re removal, hostage taking of some of these areas by the Armenian soldiers, uh, looting and, and indiscriminate killing of men, women and children. Uh, the second moving clockwise is the uh, massacre of Polish officers and other elites um, by uh, the NKVD during um, the early phases of World War II in the Kachin Forest. Uh, this memorial here is in New Jersey. Uh, sort of demonstrating the, you know, the, the potent memory of what happened in Kachin with that sort of stab in the back by the allies, allies of the Polish people. Uh, so, of course, here we have a higher number of individual kills, individual individuals killed, uh, and perhaps a more discriminant ma massacre. But certainly, you know, there is the looting of the personal possessions and uh, the removal of them from camp to camp as well. It is believed that um, nearly 22,000 soldiers uh, and officers died uh, in this series of massacres. Uh, the next one moving then down to the bottom right is the uh, Tulsa massacre uh, of 1921. Here, you know, a range between 100 to 300 people died. Uh, there was looting, burning, indiscriminate killing. Um, uh, local militias you know, ran throughout the streets, shooting down um, you know, black residents of the Greenwood district as they tried to escape. And then there was indeed a removal of survivors into forced labor camps uh, for a period following the massacre. And then finally, uh, during the American Revolutionary War, Gaden Houghton massacre of uh, converted Christian Delaware Indians uh, by uh, a Pennsylvania uh, militia uh, resulted in the death of uh, just under 100 uh, uh, Delawares. Um, here we see looting, burning of homes, uh, indiscriminate killing of men, women and children, desecration of the bodies, uh, and then of course you know, further forced removal. What's important about all these cases is that they served as a key point of memory for each of these groups, both as a way of explaining subsequent conflict, uh, a way of perceiving genocide going forward, uh, both in the contemporary sense in some of these examples, um, but particularly within the, you know, the, the decade or so or two as an aftermath of these particular incidents. 
uh, and this is one of the key points of comparison to Gatumba. So uh, just as an overall analysis of part of the comparative work that I did here, you know, I found you know, several uh, key elements that are listed on the left here, ranging from the severity of the attack, didn't necessarily mean that there was a high death toll, but certainly that war was a driving factor uh, within these cases um, that determined the severity of the violence. Um, there certainly is involved, the involvement of more perpetrated groups makes the violence more severe or deadly. Uh, perceptions of genocide uh, resulted from the massacre um, and added to sort of the memory of these events. Um, there's also, you know, an element of real or perceived enemy amid the civilians as a justification in most of all of these cases. There was perceived to be real or perceived uh, to be the presence of a guilty people within the civilian group that were targeted which is again the same in Gatumba as well, as is argued by the FNL. Uh, there's certainly a state of crises that's going on here as well, or state in crises. Uh, and that genocide here, and this is probably one of the important points, is that genocide did not have to be a situational context to frame the massacre um, or future possession, uh, perceptions of it. Um, so in order for these massacres to take place, it didn't necessarily mean that uh, genocide had to be part of that context for it to matter or to be used to define it going forward. So just to add some points here about Gatumba before I kind of wrap up um, with the conclusion um, and how I'm then trying to fit this into other research that I've done you know, with the Bernie Milinga communities. Uh, this Gatumba has certainly added to a collective and direct experiences of genocide and these you know, range for this group of uh, people back to the 1990s, witnessing the Rwandan genocide, um, you know, seeing the destruction of you know, refugee camps across, um, across the Cong Congo during the First Congolese War, uh, and then you know, subsequent attacks on the community themselves uh, after, the, after that fact. Uh, it certainly created a core narrative of plot points across participant interviews. Uh, Gatumba has that same representation of sort of a symbol of genocide and uh, it's sort of a potent point of narrative. Uh, however, what we do see happening is there's kind of an obf obfuscation of complex identity categories here. Um, and oftentimes, you know, an event like Gatumba results in kind of a simplification of identities and of narratives that tend to be more victim oriented, um, which, you know, at least in the context of, uh, you know, conflict that's ongoing in Congo, and then even in the last couple of decades, it, um, it doesn't help us necessarily to see uh, sort of the full picture and analytical uh, perspective. Um, and so one of the other sort of key points I want to stress here before I finish up is, you know, is genocide a backdrop or a driving factor? Is it that genocide is the context and environment for an attack like Katumba, or is it then, or is it, or sorry, is it seen as the backdrop or is it a driving factor? Uh, what I mean to say here uh, is that, you know, is genocide going on or is it perceived to be going on and then used as an explanation after the fact? Uh, and I, you know, this is something that I'm still, you know, investigating and I think we need to recognize the complexity of that, um, that you know, the genocide is, can be seen as, you know, is it a driving factor here of violence like Katumba, or is it sort of broad, part of a broader, um, you know, social context here? I'm happy to clarify that a little bit later on because that maybe wasn't too clear. So just to finish up, um, there's a, a couple of quotes here, um, just on sort of the impact and the meaning of uh, this incident, just to sort of give that a bit more uh, context for you. Um, of course, you know, memory and justice are key elements and you know need to be mentioned here. Uh, as you know, some of you know, the ICC Burundi case um, it may not well. It's there still, but it's limited to 2015 and 17 and, and looking at sort of more internal uh, political violence and the question of genocide or crimes against humanity than necessarily what's happened, what ha happened in Gatumba. Um, uh, massacre memory and redress as an organizing principle uh, of the Banyamalenga diaspora, right? And so I, what I posit is that, um, you know, 
this kind of massacre does create a genocide narrative identity and it, it does so to the point that it is an organizing principle of the diaspora it is a sort of point of rallying it's a point of key um importance in the narrative um and so you then need to think about the question of, of effectiveness of international activism that focuses on single moments uh, by and large we can see how this is effective um but does this contribute to conflict resolution uh, going forward um David Reef's work in praise of forgetting quite controversial, but kind of brings us to this point, right? That there is often within memory, uh, this asymmetrical balance of the historical significance uh, of events and the constructed uh, memory of them. Uh, meaning that, you know, just because uh, um, an event is prominent in a group's memory doesn't necessarily mean that it's historically significant. Uh, there are certainly many, many massacres of um, Banya Malangi and you know between and amongst other groups across up and down Eastern Congo and across the whole country. Um, but what is it that's significant in memory about this particular incident? Uh, and this is something that I've tried to define here. So I'll leave it there and we I guess I'll pass it back over to to Delphine for questions. <laughs>